I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. Back in the first season of the show, I talked to a young artist named Selma Carrion. During the interview, she told me about how she briefly apprenticed at a tattoo shop. It occurred to me I didn't really know much about tattoo artists. How they start out, what it takes to become one, I mean anything really. And since then I thought I should talk to one and find out. And it turns out one had found me. He messaged me on the American Bandito Facebook page. I'm known as Stripe. Uh, I own Ultimate Arts Tattoo. I've been tattooing here for 20 some odd years. Real name's Mike, so if anyone doesn't like nicknames, but there's just too many Mikes in the world. So how else are you gonna spread it out? But gotta be a little more specific. So Stripe is the preferred that I go by. So he invited me over there to sit down and talk with him about what he does. Around the time that we spoke, they had just released the Bucky's on Parade statues across Madison, and he had been commissioned to do one of them. I told you in the email earlier I was working on a Bucky. Right. You know, so the Bucky Badgers just got put out. That one, they only gave me technically like about a month. And okay. so that took an entire month out of life. And I was in the middle of other projects, plus I had the full-time work. So I just spread a whole bunch of regular schedule stuff around to get that Bucky done. Yeah. And then there's been several events where we've had to go, like the release, private release and the public release. Mm -hmm. It just took a whole ton of time recently. And then uh, I just finished the Ale Asylum can which gets uh, premiered very, very soon. I didn't know about that one. This one's fun. I, the Hopalicious can, I did a painting, and it's a version of the original, but it's different. And so now uh, the new face of the Hopalicious can is a painting I did. I'm super excited about that one. Because, right. uh, well, we run a big charity through here. It's the largest the largest one-day toy drive for Toys for Tots, we think in the country. We can't find one bigger, but it's at least the biggest in the Midwest. And so we're doing, uh, instead of taking any payment on this can... They're uh, donating a percentage of every can sold to the event, which will help run the event. We're going to be able to make it bigger, more advertising, more banners, signs, right. T-shirts. It's already huge, but now we're going to make it huger. How are you getting these projects? Over time, by building up a good name, they all come to me. Every okay. single one of them came to me on that. The Bucky one, I'd already done a cow, and I'd already done uh, a giraffe. They were fun. you know. That was like back in 2006 and maybe 2010 or something. They are fun projects. They're all for the same guy who owns Midwest Family Broadcasting, and he has them all. Oh, he's he's okay. purchased them. So he asked me to do the next one, so they all look the same. So they're all similar. So he keeps them in the middle of his uh, big radio station building, displayed all around it. So it's just to continue the process. Where did you work on it at? Because uh, <laughs> I'm looking around here, and I'm not no, sure No, it's not here. No, here. I have a home studio, too. Okay. But it started out when we get this cow years ago. I built an art studio in my basement to do the cow. Mm. Then it flooded thank you to insurance, I got a much better art studio out of it. Okay. And then along comes the draft, and that was perfect for that. And I was all ready to do the Bucky in the art studio, and he didn't fit in the basement. He was uh, probably about a foot too wide in every single direction to go down the stairs and fit through the thing. So I had to make another, a makeshift art studio in my living room. You, you're like, where's the hardest spot I could put it in the first place, so I'll do the basement? Like, why wouldn't you just do that to begin with? <laughs> well, I, no, I got given the project before I saw it. I was given a piece of paper with measurements, and when I pulled out the uh, you know, tape measure, not even close. Right. Not even right. possible. Where did it end up at? I know I've seen it, but I don't know where it is publicly. It's, on, uh, it's 449 State Street. It's across the street from the chocolate shop, and... Pita Pit. If you take the two of those and put a line between them, he's in the middle. I actually used to work where that Pita Pit was. I used to work there when it was Artwave. I totally remember that. I, yeah, <laughs> they, they, the airbrush shirts and the uh, the pressed shirts, and that, that place was exciting as a kid. I believe there was an airbrusher part-time there. She was from the Dells. It was interesting because she was around my mom's age, and people would come up and be like, I want a skull and this, and like ask for like this crazy stuff, and she's like, yeah, sure, whatever. You know, that hits home. Because I am now, uh, I'm 46, and when I started tattooing, I was in my 20s, so that was early 20s. Mm -hmm. And I knew the newest things back then. Mm -hmm. And now at 46, I don't know the newest things. Oh. That's been a struggle to research all the time to figure out what 18 to 21-year-olds are asking for. If I don't keep up on it almost weekly, I fall behind so fast. It totally feel for that airbrush lady. But I would go watch her. Because I, I couldn't figure out how to airbrush for the People life of me. Go do that. Yeah, I bought the whole airbrush set and struggled and struggled. Mm, it was an awful experience, but I would sit and watch her and try and learn tricks on how to pull the finger back and, and how to use the um, uh, different masks. And so I got a little bit out of her, but then when I finally bought videos and figured it out, made up. She was your YouTube. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, today I would just go on YouTube and punch that in and exactly. find out techniques. But for I had to sit and stare and ask questions, and, yeah. which actually, I don't know, that was just fun. Mm. 
when did you decide to start this place? Like, did you just one day go, I'm going to open a tattoo shop? No. It was a path. Okay. Well, okay, it goes back uh, all the way, like, high school. I uh, used to hang out in a tattoo shop. And I thought, this was the greatest job ever. Talking smack all the time and having fun. And it just seemed cool. And they drew. They'd sit around and draw all the time. So then I went to art school and cooking school at the same time. That was a neat part of the path, though, too. Where would you do that at? Uh, over at MATC. It was an arts degree when you get the uh, cooking degree. And then so that way I could go to art classes without having to be in the art program. And I yeah. could just go back and forth freely. And I took extra classes at night. Didn't have to pay the extra tuition. And was able to use all the resources in the art department. So didn't like the tattoo business. Went into that thinking I'd work in the food advertising business. So I was trying to combine the two. Oh, okay. With, uh, you look at like gourmet magazines and stuff. These beautiful food displays. That's what I wanted to do. Right. That looked fun. There's not much work for that. When you were doing it, maybe there wasn't. Like, now their entire network's dedicated to it. People cook everything. Cake shows. Yeah, back then there was like one or two good cooking TV shows, yeah. and then that was it, and they were on public television. So you know they had big money involved there. You could probably <laughs> maybe even feed a family, right? Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But then um, all of a sudden this explosion happened in the early 90s in tattoos. These guys, Paul Booth and Guy Atkinson and Philip Blue and all these tattoo artists, any tattoo artist listening is going to, totally know who I'm talking about. Okay. No one else on the entire world to care. Yeah. But these, this group of people all of a sudden brought art into the business and actually made things look like paintings and look like they were real, not look like they were done in a carnival or okay. a prison. And that got exciting. Hmm. So then I looked into the idea of tattooing and a guy uh, kind of snagged me up more than anything and brought me in and I got to draw and paint and then learn how to do tattoos. And yeah. That was uh, a very quick like a flight into the business. The way you describe it reminds me of like when Todd McFarlane came along and like he like changed the way the comic book industry depicted how you're supposed to draw things. 100% same thing. Because all of a sudden everything went from like really garbage to all of a sudden, oh, we can do quality. And it just piggybacked on itself. And that's never stopped ever since. We've had a lot of discussions recently about the idea how uh, about every five years another huge leap happens in the tattoo business. We're watching some big leaps going on right now. For an example, I was saying about the art school, me and Jim that I work with were the only two that had any art school experience, like anywhere that we could even find in the state in tattooing 20 years ago. Today, you can't even go into this business without having really serious experience. At one time, we were the artists in the area, and we did all the really good artwork, and we were trained, had techniques behind us. We were probably the only people that understood how to use a color wheel, from what I could tell, or any color theory or design background. And then everyone started studying and working harder. Like I said, you can't even get into it at all without some type of a degree or... One of the people that I talked to uh, in the first season, she was just out of high school and she was interested in getting into tattooing. And she explained to me that you need to apprentice mm -hmm. for a certain amount of hours, which when she told me that it makes total sense. You can't yeah. just all of a sudden go, I'm going to do this and then just start marking people up. You have to have the experience. Apprenticeship's always been there. That okay. goes back into the 20s, 30s, 40s. But the apprenticeship has changed a lot. At one time... Um, an apprenticeship meant you clean their toilets, you clean the floor, you clean their car. Everything they told you to do, and it was never good enough, and they would yell at you and scream at you, maybe even boot camp-like. It would go way back, even probably even to the 70s, it was probably still that way. But when I started, it was a change. We had to do a lot of cleaning and extras, and then any free time you get, we're drawing and drawing and drawing. Today, when I see apprentices, they actually have lists of things they have to do. It was more free-for-all back when we did it. We just had to do it for two years. We just had to work under a guy for a year and a half, two years. After a while, he says, I think you're good enough to actually do a tattoo. But now that's all done on paper and with fake skin and a longer process of actual training. One of the hang-ups that anybody who goes into drawing has to learn is eventually, like, you start to draw and you get so worried that, you know, everything just seems so final and you got to stop treating what you're going to draw as like a gentle snowflake and just do it. And then if you make a mistake, you erase it. No, that's not the case here. So how do you get over that anxiety? The anxiety starting tattooing is horrible and it's never gone away. Every time you walk into a piece, if you're not studied at it, you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. If uh, it takes a lot of pre-thought, pre-planning, sometimes drawing it two or three times on paper. Well, and now I could use an iPad to draw stuff a lot. That's kind of fun. So, <laughs> right. so I can make my changes on there and uh, draw over the top of the drawings and then still doing it by hand again on top of all that. And so hopefully I've practiced it at least three times before I even get onto the skin, at least for the really 
difficult ones. You get the simple ones. I've already done it. There was a time I bet yeah, I did a Bucky Badger at least twice a week for okay. 10 years straight. So your Bucky Badger was the Calvin peeing on a Ford symbol. And I've done just as many as them. <laughs> yeah. So after you do them, you know it. Your brain has a library. You know, you know that book, that drawing from the right side of the brain? The entire idea of the book is to get rid of that existing library mm. and draw what you're seeing. Well, the help of a tattoo artist is if you can get that library in your head, you know exactly how to draw it. Someone says, I want a rose. Brrrp, I can draw out a rose because I've done a million of them yeah. right on the spot. That Kelvin or the Bucky or the whatever the subject matter that's been done three million times, you just know it and you do it and try to improve it each time and try and make it better. But that, that would made tattooing easy years ago. Today is a little tougher because there's so many new variables and variations, so you have to keep updating your library. There are, when you think about it, staples in tattoo art that have been there forever, roses being one of them. Why are some of them like the, the go-tos? for tattoos. One is because they look good. Yeah. <laughs> Another one is their, uh, the organic shape of a rose, for an example, it can be a great cover up because you can adjust it and tweak it to go over another one. Mm. Where say um, a sun, you can't, you, you have a, a circle, you have to have a circle. Uh, most of the time it's got exact rays that are geometrical coming out of it, so mm. you can't mess with it. But a rose, every single petal can adjust just that little bit to match another line. Mm -hmm. You can get really bright colors, you get dark colors, there's all sorts of meaning behind a rose. A rose is popular because it's easy. Mm -hmm. Then it's, a, it's an easy decision, it's easy to make look good, easy to work with. Yeah, some of the staples are there for a reason, because they work. And also it's popular. Like yeah. you look at paintings uh, forever and ever and ever, landscapes have been like the biggest selling paintings out there because yeah. they work mm -hmm. and they look good. So therefore it's going to continue to work. We talked about the apprenticeship. What's your method for apprenticeship? Oh, I don't do them. Okay. I, I don't want nothing to do with it. Uh, I, the last apprentice I had was about 10 years ago. She did very well, but it, it's so much work getting them there. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of extra pressure. I... For a while, I used to work 80 to 100 hours a week, and it just beat me silly. And that was just tattooing, barely able to get the book work done, barely able to get payroll done every week. It, I kept getting behind on bills, not because I didn't have any money for it. I didn't have time to pay them. Mm -hmm. But when you got an extra 20 hours a week just because of an apprentice, of, of extra work on me, plus I could be, you know, well 40, 50 hours of tattooing, then doing all the cleaning, then doing all the fixing, it just was beating me up really bad. So I backed all that way off, and one of the ways to do it is no longer having apprentice. I just don't want to work that hard. <laughs> I want to keep to about 50 hours a week. I, I, I didn't have time to paint. I didn't have time to do sculpture stuff. I didn't have time to do uh, anything else except for tattoo all the time. I'm just relearning website design. Okay. Um, I'm learning how to use 3D printers, which is so fun. That one's really fun. Have you actually done any 3D printing? But yeah, I bought a little one. Um, it's just a, have one. Yep, it, it's just a little tiny one. It's got a little five-inch little base on it. So the biggest thing I can make is about five inches side to side, and I think it goes up to six inches tall. Trying to learn how to use CAD-type designing for the first time. I, I spent months. Yeah, five minutes didn't do it. And I watched a ton of YouTube tutorials, and that made it harder. Because yeah. the people that are doing it most of the time are very mathematical, architecty type people, and I'm not that. I, I can't figure this stuff out, so I had to break it down to the simplest and uh, learn how to do letters first. And then I, I made a bunch of parts out of necessity. Okay. Like, um... But we got a vending machine here that was broken. It was going to cost me like three hundred dollars in parts. So I just sat down for a couple nights, building these parts no over and over and over. And so then I got like a couple bucks into them now. Okay, you know, and fixed the whole vending machine. And which is what everybody says that you're supposed to do with those. But instead, people are like, "I'm going to build a Darth Vader action figure or something like that." Out of that necessity, yeah, is how I learned how to use the actual CAD programs awesome. and make some stuff from scratch. But most of the 3D printing I've been able to do is you download stuff, tweak it, yeah, and then uh, do it. And then painting, it's kind of fun. Learning how to paint on plastic without melting it, that's interesting. Or melting it just enough to make it look smooth or yeah. give it a different texture. You were telling me that you were talking to the guy from uh, Sector 67 about painting on 3D models. Yeah, he had a bunch of really cool ideas, and uh, that's a neat artist thing. Yeah. When you get two artists that all of a sudden go, well, I can do this and show him a picture of what you do, and he does that, and when this light up comes into people's eyes, but I can do that and check that. Do you want to know this little trick? And you want to know this little trick? And that mm -hmm. turned from what probably would have been like a two minute discussion, and I think we sat there for an hour in the middle of the Atwood Fair just talking about how to paint. Yeah, he had a whole uh, pile of these uh, alien eggs painted in really cool ways that were, uh, they looked like drippy, but 3D within the paint and cracked. Mm -hmm. and, and that got all exciting. And then I thought he did it a different way using uh, uh, 
clear coats and spray painting over the top of wet clear coats but then he was explaining he did it a different way and then oh. he had never heard of what i'd heard of and so it went back and forth and made it really fun That's and it, cool. but that light up in the eyes between artists when you're like oh i i got an idea oh yeah. with that and well and then then the sharing starts and that makes it fun the other projects that you're working on do you have anything specific that you're doing like the projects at home started a wildlife series of paintings which uh, i finished an elephant which I don't know if you're familiar with the way Milwaukee Zoo has got it going on right now, but they yeah. um, they have an elephant problem. They're getting a new enclosure, but they're having all sorts of problems with contractors, and mm. so. But they're getting a ton of flack from every animal rights group out there, and it's kind of one of them. Just hold on, it's coming. This big elephant thing. So I, I got inspired by seeing that, and got some pictures of some of the elephants there. Are you just doing these yourself, or are you actually doing this for them? It's for me. I really like zoos. My girlfriend works in zoos and with animals, and so I gotta hear it all the time, and it keeps clicking through my head, so mm. I know all the backstories, and it just makes me want to do that. And, and for yeah. years, I used to do dark art stuff. I, I think I was a little more pissed off when I was younger. Required by law when you're younger. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. to get all the anger out was that, and today, I don't know, I, I live a much more a happier, peaceful life. Mm. And so the animals just feel better to do. And it, it it's fun to work with what's there versus nightmares. The zoo animal thing made me realize with tattoo art, you're literally selling everything you make because when you make something, you're getting paid to do it. When you work on other things, how do you promote and sell those or do you? That's a great place about here. I sell them here. I sell prints, uh, like we're surrounded by paintings I did. Yeah. But out in the, the lobby, I got prints. You know, I, I sell them relatively cheap because people will buy them like crazy. They'll oh. buy a $10 print that looks neat. And, hey, this is the guy that did my tattoo, did this painting. Versus actual paintings, I've sold a few, but I put a higher price tag on them so they don't sell, because I okay. like to keep them. It's a nice little extra income around Christmas. It's like you have your own booth. That's a good point. Like, yeah. people come here, they already know what you can do. Yeah, they'll look at the actual real painting right here, and then realize when they're checking out that, oh, wait, for... 10 or 20 bucks, I could have my own copy of that. When you've had people say, I want this, and you have to draw it for them, you know, like, I want a tattoo like this, then do sometimes they go, I can I just buy that instead and not get the tattoo? No, a lot of times I just give them the artwork when I'm done, too. Unless it's something I know I'm going to need if I need to do a touch-up, I need the reference. But then I could also take a picture, too. Are there ones where you're like, that's really cool, do you mind if we put this on one of our, like, uh, you know, you can choose from, or do you oh. even do that, the choose from the design? Well, those days are gone. I, I have racks of stuff like that out there, but I, I just keep it there for something to look at and i tell people as soon as they're flipping through i said don't pick anything out of there they're just fun things yeah. might spark your attention but we're gonna draw everything from scratch okay yeah or google because yeah. unfortunately <laughs> that's what everyone does right now that, that's a it's an awful and an awesome trend at the same time I know. people bring in their phones mm -hmm. and i want this tattoo mm -hmm. well i'm not doing that tattoo because that's someone else's tattoo but we can use that as our inspiration and start from there and go for it. You've seen the movie Obey Giant about Shepard Ferry, like his whole thing where he used the picture that he did for the Obama poster, the Hope one, yeah. was actually taken from a Google News image that he found. And then he ended up getting sued by the guy that took the picture. And yeah, same sort of thing. Only you're looking at actual artists that will be like, I can... I know for a fact that that's my tattoo. Yes, yeah, and it, there's even a big movement I've been watching on Instagram right now of people like fighting that, mm -hmm. where they're calling people out on it and posting them on pages of tattoo copycats. And I gotta tell you, wait for some of the pieces I've done to show up on there, because you, you don't always have a choice. I want this, so I, I try to change it a little, yeah. but it's not enough to make it unrecognizable. People would still be able to go, that came from this guy's piece, right. it came from that. And, eh. Sorry to everyone out there I've done that, but hey, you've done it to me too. And also the nature of art is that it's built upon from somewhere. Same with music, same with language. I mean, it's tough not to to go, we absolutely can't draw anything because it's already been done. Right. You'd never be able to. My brother is an attorney, and he was telling me how uh, every attorney steals each other's paperwork, or I don't know the exact wording for it, but when they, when they write something that winds up being published somewhere or that this is a theory of law, that everyone steals them from each other. Everyone steals a contract writing from each other. Mm -hmm. And they take it as a point of pride. That changed the way I think about it. So I have got a lot of tattoos that I know I've drawn from scratch that they're my originals. I see them pop up in tattoo magazines. I see them pop up all over online. Mm -hmm. And I think without thinking of it that way, 
I would probably be offended and they stole my stuff. Mm -hmm. But instead I go, they liked my stuff. Exactly. And someone liked it enough to want to do another version and hopefully mine was better. And sometimes if I see someone else do it even better yet, then I can learn something. I think if people just realized a little bit of attribution helps that. Like if they did that and said, this was inspired by a piece done by. That should be done a lot more often. And I am totally guilty of not doing that. And I really, <laughs> really should. The one thing that I am asked all the time by young artists, how do I get better? How do I do this? How do I do that? Mm -hmm. uh, especially even when people want to get into tattooing, there is only one piece of advice. Draw, draw, draw. And when you're sick of drawing, keep drawing. Don't stop. If, if you get sick of drawing, go paint. Do something. Just draw. Never, ever quit. Even if it sucks, throw it away. Start over. It doesn't matter. Just keep doing it until you're used to it. And that's the only way to get good. There is no trick. And I'm asked that, I, mean, I bet you at least once a week, what's the trick? Yeah. There isn't one. Just keep drawing. If you ever want to make money at art, your soul goes first. Yeah. <laughs> For me, it still doesn't matter what kind of preparation you can do before inking a tattoo. I can't get over the idea that I would just mess it up. I get stuck in my own head just thinking about it. Like one time I was at an event recently and someone asked me to draw a cat or something on their cast. I was like, okay, I can do that. And when I was done, they were like, what is that? And I was like, it's a cat. It was totally a cat. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to get past thinking about that. I'm currently in the process of recording episodes for season four. I've got a list of people I want to talk to, but just like what happened on this episode, feel free to contact me if you would like to be on the show. You can message me on the American Bandito Facebook page or email me at tom at americanbandito.com. And to be reminded when the next season begins, sign up for the email list at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. The music for the show is by Lorenzo's Music, and you can hear more at Lorenzo'sMusic.com. This was supposed to be the last episode of the season. One of the people I spoke to a few episodes back inspired me to try something crazy, so I did. And next week, there'll be a bonus episode. I'll be talking to a person that was very influential to me. Find out who it is next time. Until then, so long.